By the late 1980s, it was apparent that the Soviet Union was beginning to crumble. Ethnic issues that had been suppressed by decades of communist ideology suddenly came to the forefront. Enclaves such as nagorno karabakh were swept by freedom ideologies and demanded self-determination. Partly due to Turkic ethnocentrism, violence erupted against Armenians living in Azerbaijan. The cities of Sumgait and Baku were the setting for brutal pogroms that the world noticed for a few moments, but then as if following some arcane tradition, soon forgot. The Russians under Gorbachev urged the Armenian world, which was reeling from a devastating earthquake, to wait for a peaceful solution. The Armenians of Artsakh, however, decided that they were the captains of their fate and defended themselves. Garapakh, or Artsakh in the ancient tongue, claimed that it had the right to self-rule under Soviet law. Azerbaijan claimed the territory was under its sovereign jurisdiction. For a time, the tides of war turned against the 150,000 Armenians, losing much of their land to Azerbaijan in 1992. But the tides shifted again in 1993, partly due to changing politics within Azerbaijan and a politically unstable Russia, allowing the inhabitants to reclaim their own villages and create security zones at Lachin, Fizuli, Kelbajar, and Ahdam. The world, which seemed to have been sleeping up to now, suddenly woke up and decried the actions of Gharapakh as aggressive. Oil money helped Azerbaijan win some political support within the United Nations and the West, as well as military aid. U.S. oil companies sent mercenaries to train Azeri troops. Even Afghanistan sent Mujahideen mercenaries. Turkey, a NATO ally with its own ethnic agenda, had laid claims to the Armenian region of Zangezur. Sending aid to Azerbaijan, Turkey hoped to crush both Armenia and Artsakh and create a corridor of influence on all Turkic peoples. Russia, dealing with the chaos in its government, could only play both sides against each other. Armenia, surrounded as usual by instability and hostility, fell on difficult times. The news media, however, turned a deaf ear, choosing to ignore the over 50,000 casualties of a major war in its sixth year. The historic northern region of Shahumyan remained isolated, its soldiers living on what was considered by them the worst front of the war. And as little Artsakh fought numerically superior Azerbaijan to a standstill, what was once a virtual Garden of Eden started to become a graveyard.
Some years ago, two Armenians from Fresno volunteered to help the inhabitants of Nagorno-Karabakh in their war for independence. At that time, most of Karabakh had been captured by Azerbaijan, a former Soviet Republic. The Armenians of Karabakh were faced with superior Azeri forces, whose overlords did not want to give up the rich pasture lands and resources that had been handed to them by Stalin. Garo Kakejian and Shai Ajamian returned time after time, eventually forming a volunteer unit called the Crusaders. Bringing help and supplies from the United States, Kakejian led his reconnaissance force in battle after battle in places like Tazakent, Hatrut, Kelbajar, Harutunagomer, Mardakert, and finally Maraouz. Maraouz was the last time the white bear would fight. A year later, I met Ajamian, who had continued Garo's work. He was planning to return to Garapag and asked me to go along. One camera makes a noise of a thousand guns, he said. The unit was now led by Armenian-born Artur Pogosyan, another of Kakejian's old comrades. With new members in a 15-man force codenamed Spidak Arch, Ajamian and the rest were flown to the newly retaken mountains over Gulistan, in the region of Shaumian, where along with a garrison called Yerni, they would face off against a 500-strong Azeri regiment. Some of the Spidak arches, including Pogosian, had already spent a grueling winter in the forests. On April 24, 1994, the Azeris stormed Gyoktapa. Hours later, they were beaten back into the trees. and arches were up in the mountains to the north. A battalion was attempting to retake the region from Mir Bashir. At the beginning of May, I found myself in the trench, overlooking a fearsome artillery exchange. Though the Armenians had once fought in the safety of the hills they knew so well, Chaili was wide open terrain. On this day, the Garabakh forces would give over 50 killed and many more wounded. The battle was taking place by the same mountain range as Kakejin had fallen, not a few hundred yards from where I now sought shelter from the rain of shells.
Sudden bad weather brought the day's operations to a standstill. Both sides were blinded by the heavy fog. Rain had re-soaked the muddy roads, making travel on them nearly impossible. There are no paved roads this far north. One guy even asked me which I liked more, the Russian Vilis or the American Jeep Wrangler. Jeepa? I said theirs was better. Ah. I lied. Boy, I got. Make good luck. I sometimes pause and wonder at the kinds of people that used to live here. At the kinds of soldiers that have passed through the dusty streets of Maraus. What were their names? Did they ever come back from their glorious wars? Who will rebuild the churches after the shells have torn holes in them? Who will tell the children that it's safe to come out and play? Before the fateful morning in June of 93, the white bear had made his headquarters in a house close to the front. He had drawn a map on the wall for the coming battle Artur took me there to show me that the map was still standing. There's no place as naturally rich as Garapag, Artur says. When we go into the mountains, you'll see. It's truly a miracle. It's easy to see why the Azeris are reluctant to lose their grip on this land. Their desire to drive the Armenians out and settle the land is seen everywhere. Deserted Armenian homes have been marked as property by the Azeri soldiers that were once stationed here. The homes themselves have been looted.
their previous owners have either died or fled. Armenian books have been trampled underfoot. Later on that day, some of the men of the compound gathered for a rare treat. <laughs> it seems that wherever there is a barbecue, you'll find an Armenian. Or is it the other way around? You'll also find horses here. Karapal used to be famous for breeding stout horses until the Russians came and took them all away for their Cossacks. However blissful this whole thing was, my time in the quiet village was nearing an end. Maragiz is on the way to the Gulistan front. We stop here to wait for the armored personnel carrier, called an MTLB, which will take us up to Yeragir. As we get there by night, I see nothing. The next day, however, a whole new world opens up before my eyes. Yeragir is the first mountain outpost. In 1862, the last Armenians left here driven away by Azeris. The foundations of their homes, their churches, and cemeteries remained. Some months ago, the Armenians returned with a vengeance. Since we're carrying supplies, we continue on for as much of the way as the Antel Bay will take us. Marav Peak, the Everest of Gharapar, looms up ahead. We finally meet up with some of Artur's men out on patrol, and the rest of the journey is made on foot. The path we take winds around the south side of the mountain because the Azeris have lookouts watching from the north for any activity and have been known to bombard the area at the smallest provocation. The green tapestry of these Shahumian hills infects the mind of anyone who sees it for the moment. It still feels like heaven. Who's the oldest one, I ask? Dead here, they say. He's the oldest. He's 57. 
He's been fighting nearly all his life. Ardok is the youngest volunteer of the unit, at 19. All of these men were handpicked by Artu before the mission. Dikran used to fight in another regiment before he joined this one. Haik also used to fight in other regiments. His brother Manuel was shot by a Russian major while trying to break into an armory. We eat anything here, he says. Snakes, frogs, whatever you want. Grass, leaves. <laughs> We can't get any bread here, any fresh bread. The bread is so hard I can crack my skull with it. <laughs> At least the water is good. Yeah, the water is good. The air is good too. This is how it is. Yesterday there was a battle, and we all went into the forest. It started to rain really heavily. We didn't have any raincoats to keep us from the rain. While we were in the battle, our raincoats ripped. Our guns got wet. This is a very difficult situation. How many of us had gone under that? Three or four of us have gone under the same raincoat. These are Garo's pickles. He brought them a year ago and we're still using them. Every time we eat them, we think about him. What else are you eating? Morning, noon, and night, we're eating this. I don't know what the heck it is. Man, this bread is so hard. If you hit a dead person with it, it would wake him up. Once Amiran found some tree sap to flavor this with, our teeth were stuck together like this for a couple of days. This is it every day, and if we can find sugar to go with it, we're happy. At times, we don't even have salt. See those weeds behind you? For a week, we ate nothing but weeds. We boiled them and ate them. Without oil, without salt, we just put them in water, boiled it, and ate it. And this bread? This bread is a month old. If it stays any longer, it'll be penicillin. <laughs> Everyone tries hard to avoid the motor shells that Arizeri's fire over. Melcida, the garrison nurse, showed me a piece of shrapnel that had been removed from a victim some days before. There were two casualties that day, caught off guard. Romik was a father of three and was the hardest hit. In a few days, he was due to go home. After an hour of struggling with inadequate medicine, he passed away. Sensing he was about to give up, Melcida got mad at him. You'll be all right, she said. But an hour later, he was gone.
I asked Melcida if she was a trained nurse. I've been out here for almost four years, she said. And everything I've learned, I've learned by watching and doing. Everything I've learned, I've learned by seeing. I haven't learned it out of books, from an institute. Where's your husband, I asked. He's in Russia, she said. He's Russian. I asked him what he thought about our battle. He doesn't want to fight. He said, I'm neither Armenian nor Azeri. A wise man doesn't fight for another man's soil. He says, I can't get involved in that. We're fighting for our land, for our soil. He's another race. What would he fight? I asked her what she would say to the diaspora in Armenia. Well, I think, she says, the diaspora shouldn't want another exile to take place. And this time it would be Artsakh that's exiled. Last time it was Armenia, in 1915, from Van, from Mush, from Erzerum. But Artsakh, if it was exiled, where would it go? Artsakh has to remain Artsakh. Hovik Da, or Uncle Hovik, is also 57. He and Ashod were part of the original Yegnik garrison here. Hovig is married and has a family. His 18-year-old son was killed when Shahumyan fell. He vowed to return. Both have spent their lives up here. Dikran, on the other hand, is from Abaran in Armenia. His reasons for being here are his ideals. His grandfather was a well-known Fedai called Magar the Elder. We have to persevere, he says. This is our struggle. The Russian isn't going to do the fighting for us. If any other race fights for us, it defeats our ideal. We can't have runaways or mercenaries here. Some of the people you see around here look like deserters. It's a real hurt when I realize most of our nation doesn't know what we're going through. By losing Harappa, we will eventually lose part of ourselves. Our fate as a nation will be sealed, will be lost. It's true that Armenian fighters are few, we're few. Ashod accurately said, some are wounded and some are dead. Some are even disillusioned. They put the gun down. They're tired of fighting. Very few have persevered till today. But we thank God that new fighters rise to fill the gap. When I first lifted up a gun, I'd only seen a Kalashnikov. Everything I learned, I just learned by doing. You have to live it, you have to feel it, you have to see it and learn it. There are two kinds of people here on Gyogtapa, those who hate being here and those who hate being here. 
In addition to the hunger, there's the isolation, the endless wait for an enemy attack that may or may not come. <laughs> He's asking us if we have any plates to eat on. I told him we didn't come here to eat. So why would we need plates? And what are these? Aren't these plates? <laughs> I was from Abaran. Abaran's were the butt of everybody's jokes, a little dense as the story goes. At least he had good taste in music. He and Deco hogged my cassette player for the duration, listening to everything from Alan Parsons to Depeche Mode. As the weather began to worsen, we spent one night taping a thunderstorm. It was as if the mountain was angry at us for being there. But life on the whole picked up whenever the weather allowed it. Hamlet took me to the peak of Gyogtapa, which overlooked Yulistan. In 1812, Russians and Persians signed a treaty here, giving the Russians rule over Gharapakh. Hamlet told me of how, the previous year, the Azeris had pushed them from Gyogtapa. We retreated to Ardatap, he said. There we were without food. Then later, food and help arrived. There were 17 of us. There were five grads shooting at us, and about 400 soldiers coming at us. You shoot one, you shoot two, 10, 20. But against heavy equipment, automatics don't do anything. One month ago, when the spring came, we retook this territory. I asked him how many friends he had lost in the war. I can't count them, he said. I've lost many. Which one could you talk about? You'd be close to one and share everything with them. The other one you just knew and stood at post with for a while. But the first friend of mine that died, I wasn't there. He was one of my school friends. He was from Talish. Even during a lull, the most dangerous place was up here, at the top where you were the most vulnerable to mortar fire. Communication was maintained through the use of Alan Co. radios. The disparity between the volunteer and the conscript is very obvious. The conscript in this case is not even aware of where his hometown fell to Azerbaijan, since he had fled long before that. He's not even aware of exactly where he is. <coughs> These men long for the end of their tour of duty and nothing else. To them, anything's better than freezing on a rock. When the fog clears, I take a better look at Gulistan. Azeri rocket launchers and tanks had moved into place the night before. Hamlet keeps telling me to keep my head down, and this is the reason why. Exploding mortar shells can kill at 50 yards and wound at a 100-yard radius. A week later, Shah has already become a connoisseur of fine grass. I think they have these in America, he says. 
We'll eat these there. Where's the pizza, I asked. Got lost, he said. Domino's is going to go bankrupt because of us. We keep ordering and they keep getting lost. Maybe they got lost at the airport, I add. Grass in our tea. Grass in our food. Grass for a home. Everything's grass, grass. <laughs> Soon the humor turned into gloom. Cold fog rolled in for days in a row. One day bled into another. If nature had a plan, it did not include us. <laughs> the only entertainment both sides had during this extended ceasefire were the radios. They'd call us and cuss us out and we returned the favor. It was a contest to see who could come up with the best one. There must have been Azeris there from all over. They were a mixed crowd like ours. Everything was up for grabs, from religion to politics to family members. In every language, from English to Turkish to Armenian to Russian, even Arabic. Once, one guy called and spoke to us in perfect Armenian. After a few days of eating nothing but grass and leaves, I was happy to accompany a hunting team deep into the forest. We were lucky enough to shoot a deer. Our garrison commander, Shura, carved the meat up in less than 15 minutes. Everyone was ravenous. <laughs> Boris was the one who did the actual shooting. He was a veteran of these hills, his home lying a few miles north in enemy territory. This was his fourth deer this year. Shai told him that if he was in the U.S., Boris would get fined and thrown in jail for exceeding his quota. Hardly anyone can believe it. In jail for shooting deer? Yeah, Shai said, 30 years probably in jail. And $10,000 fine for every deer you shot. How much? $10,000? Where am I going to get that? Well, Shai said you'd have to spend 130 years in jail then. <laughs> Shai, Shai, he's caught and killed his fourth deer. What's he going to do now? He's going to go to Disneyland. <laughs> After the best meat was salted, the whole camp gathered around the fire. The joke was that the Yegnigs were enjoying cannibalism. Deer eating deer, Boris said. Yeah, yeah. I have, for example, I have a picture first when I came to Karabakh. In the picture, if I'm not mistaken, six or seven people we are, and uh, the only live person left is me. Worldwide, if we were an animal, maybe we could be on the endangered species list. Six million around the world. We, 120,000 uh, Karabakhsis are fighting against seven million Azerbaijanis. With little help from Armenia all around the world, they have our support, but what kind of support? Who's fighting? Who's dying? The Karabakhs. Who we are, we are very small, very little.
This soldier had burned holes in his socks, trying to warm them over a fire after a wet night on guard duty. He had only one pair. He was stuck. The conditions that these soldiers had to live in were pathetic. Shai said maybe the homeless in the United States lived a little bit better than the Armenian soldier did. At least they got a warm meal and some shelter once in a while. The Armenian soldier, on the other hand, would have to do without all the commodities, even all the basics. How many of you sleep here, he said, at night? Three of us. Three people in this mud hole. Vertalyot is the Russian word for helicopter. Most of the ones in service here used to belong at one time to the former Soviet Union. Few were of a military nature. But without these, the soldier on the ground would be stranded, especially here in a land of harsh terrain. After a battle at Mir Bashir, supplies were brought in and the wounded evacuated. Magabuz is lucky to be closer in elevation to Stepanakert, the capital of Arapat, where supply missions originate. Marav Peak, on the other hand, is the highest point of a mountain chain that includes the embattled outposts of Yerager, Gyoktapa, and Ardatap. Of these, Ardatap has the most splendor. A ledge surrounded by mountains on nearly all sides, it has one gap by which helicopters can enter. It is a landing pad for troops headed for the northern front. Most of the men here were waiting for a ride out, for a chance to go home and see their families. Leave was long overdue. That's why I was here. My visa had expired and I was suddenly here illegally. The helicopter didn't arrive that day. We drank heavily from Ardatap's streams and bathed in a Finnish-style bathhouse that had been built by one of the veteran fighters. At night, the landlords of the hovel we were going to stay in prepared some bread, called lavash, over a wood-burning stove. Armenians enjoy being hospitable, and tonight was no different. Eight of us slept in a space three would have found crowded. But tomorrow, we hoped, we would be going home. The only thing that arrived the next day through the pass was fog. The sun was cheating us. As the days followed, any hope evaporated. Then it condensed and came down as rain. We were stuck in a worse hell than Gyoktapa could ever offer. I came to think of Ardatap as a green, beautiful prison. It's hard to describe the kinds of thoughts that come to your mind when loneliness and hunger sleep at your side. Every dark thing the busy sound of American life that shrouded is let loose. Someone 
once said that there can be no patriots on empty stomachs, and he was right. I began to curse God and every ideology that brought me here. I dreamt of food and of laughter and of my family thousands of miles away. The clouds were the lid that sealed the tomb from the outside. Even though there were quite a few of us in the same boat, our desperation made strangers out of us, and each was caught in a particular solitude, an abyss absent of mind and reason. My own version was that I had not brought anything to read. Not that I even had the heart to read. Ardatov was the farthest outpost, and the food got here last, usually stale and insufficient by the time it filtered down to us. To get here, you had to descend down a slope of at least a kilometer. Going back up was a task in itself. And even then, the area was a war zone. One couldn't just walk off and see the scenery. You might run into the wrong patrol. If we could eat frustration, though, there would have been no problem at all. Eventually, the commander of our unit had us brought back over to Gyogtapa, and we made the 30-kilometer journey down the mountain on foot. The families of the fighters of Shahumyan live in exile. One such place is a refugee camp in Armenia near Yerevan. I called it the City of Barrels. There we met Boris, who had just returned from the front. Shahumian children immediately crowded us. Their faces smiled with hope for the future, and we were their hope. Underneath the songs was a longing for a childhood paradise that no longer existed. This boy had lost his father last year. So had this little girl. This little miss was born here, away from Shahumyan. She will not know the pain of the last few years and is the most fortunate one of all. Boris had lost a daughter under the same rocket attack that maimed his younger daughter, Marina, who was 12 at the time. He still carried a pouch of dirt from his eldest's grave, which he had taken one dark, foggy night under the noses of the Azeri occupying force. Now I could see the pain that he had swallowed back at camp. Hey, 
the place for hiding. One part of me wanted to forget everything I'd seen. To leave the sorrow behind and occupy myself with other things. One man can't save the world, I told myself. But Karapak is infectious. Once there, your heart will never leave it. The green pasture lands, the fierce mountains, a wild, ageless kingdom whose descendants still mocked armies far superior to themselves. Now I knew why Shahe, Garo, and others like them returned time and time again. It had passed into their souls. All the hardship was forgotten. All you thought about were the dewdrops on the grass one foggy morning, the cold that cut to the bone, the harsh warmth of the Armenian sun. And you prayed that God granted you one more look from the mountains of Shahumyan, one more meal at the table of your friends, one more desperate prayer on the rocks of Gyoktapa. I think of those that were forced to be there and those who willingly volunteered. Of their families, of their children. And when things are quiet and the orange moon hangs in the night sky, I think of the deer in the mountains. <laughs> 